Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with SAG AFTRA Foundation and thank you so much for tuning in to watch another one of our conversations at home. I want to continue reminding everyone watching that the SAG AFTRA Foundation is a nonprofit organization which is currently raising money for a COVID-19 emergency assistance fund. This fund is working to assist SAG AFTRA members who are currently out of work due to all the closed film and television productions. So please check out the details below this video and consider supporting if you're able to in any way. Today, we are so, so fortunate to be joined by the wonderful Neil deGrasse Tyson and Andrian of Cosmos possible worlds and uh, I wanted to just kind of jump in you know we're about two months into quarantine and just ask what your day-to-day -day and, and what your normality is looking like at this point because it doesn't seem like there's any end in sight to this lockdown just yet <laughs> well personally I'm, I'm in a beautiful place in uh, Ithaca New York mm. surrounded by trees and a waterfall and so I'm very lucky um, part of the writing and conceptualizing the Cosmos television series with Brad and Braga has given me this heightened sense of appreciation of the ants and the trees and the bees and all of the life that surrounds me. So I, I have no complaints, uh, you know, uh, personally, um, and just feel very fortunate to have a refuge as lovely as this one. And just to be clear, whoever is left in the world who doesn't know anything about Cosmos, there can't be many such people. Uh, your first thought might be it's only about the rest of the universe, but part of the storytelling and part of the impact, part of the, the emotional depth to which the episodes reach within you uh, come about because of this connectivity that Anne and Brandon have, have woven into the fabric of what the viewer ex sees and experiences. So um, uh, for me in this sort of co co uh, coronaverse, um, I, I'm intrigued by the fact that there are meetings that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to attend because I'd be traveling or too busy and other, but I just slot out the 45 minutes and there's a Zoom call and there's everybody at the meeting. So I hadn't realized, I hadn't appreciated that when you meet a person face to face, it forces you to be in the same place at the same time. Whereas when everyone is separated, everyone is of course in a different place. You just have to be online at the same time in your place. <laughs> so, so as a result, I've actually been more engaged in many ways than I had been before this uh, coronavirus um, uh, descended upon us. I think that's great and it'll be interesting to see how it changes the way that we we meet and communicate when we're on the other side of this. Right. I wanted to um, dive in by asking about the show because what's so fascinating about it is you have, you know, you have kind of the larger concept of, of the show, but each episode really individually dives into so many different details and has its own theme within itself. And I was really curious about what that process looks like in the way that you map it out. Are you coming up with, you know, this is what we want to explore throughout the season and then looking for the stories or do the stories that you find really drive what the episodes become? That's a great question, Mara. And I think it's, uh, it's actually a very, my answer is, uh, it's very blended. Uh, for years before I start on a new season of Cosmos, I am hunting and gathering stories that have to work on many different levels. They have to be a, a doorway into a scientific idea, but they also have to move you emotionally and spiritually. And so very often it's the story of a life that hasn't been told before. Uh, the life of a searcher who has enhanced and added to our understanding of nature. And so then, you know, beginning this particular season, I had a very clear thematic uh, imperative, which was because I know that telling people we're all gonna die, you know, <laughs> if we don't get our act together, <laughs> it's not motivating. And, you know, I feel like I respect the audience. I know the audience feels the shadow cast on our future, maybe never more keenly than at this very moment. And so I was looking for a way to, to excite people about a future that we can still have 
but it's not going to unfold without tremendous struggle, effort on our part. And so by the time Brennan and I sat together in a room for a year or so, hammering out you know, each and every episode, we had a huge white uh, wall, which was really a, a chalkboard. And we scoped out the 13 episodes. And the idea was that they were in some sense interdigitated. There were themes introduced in the first episode that were picked up. Uh, and stories that were hinted at, that were picked up later on. So it's really a kind of a, a, a melange of the process of a year or two of thinking about how, how to celebrate the best in us uh, so that we regain the courage that we've had at different times in our history, the courage that I know we're capable of, so that we can meet this challenge and stop accepting the lies and stalling of our leaders in order to demand that future. Uh, yeah, Anne, 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 I got a question for Anne. Uh, I haven't ever perused the, the cutting room floor of your ideas. Uh, <laughs> uh, are, there, are there things there that would have been a great story but just didn't have much science in it? and other things that would have been great science, but you couldn't make a good story out of it. So they ended up in the sort of the trash bin of the cosmos creative process. Uh, yes, yes, I think some of both. But I think what really happened was those, you know, the, the arc of the series and the arc of each individual episode uh, ha has its own demands. And so from the original Cosmos that Carl and I wrote with Steve Soder, there were stories in there that we wanted to tell that we knew just didn't simply fit organically into the whole. So, you know, some of those stories uh, made their way into season two and, uh, and perhaps even season three, I can't recall specifically, but yes, you know, there's that, there, there are so many different criteria uh, for how something ends uh, up in the final cut. Yeah, and with you, Neil, I wanted to ask about kind of your role in the show in terms of, of presenting and hosting it, because obviously when you first came in for the first season that you were involved in, it's such an iconic property and everyone knows Carl's voice so well. So how did you kind of step back and think about the way that you wanted to really kind of honor his legacy with the show, but also bring your own personality, your own perspective and your own voice into it? And, and are there ways that that's evolved in this season now that you've really settled into Cosmos? Well, first I practice how to say the word billion. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you can't go, you can't do this unless you, <laughs> um, so, um, Carl Sagan has, has left an awesome legacy of bringing, um, science to the public, not just astronomy, but all of science, all of science that matters in making informed decisions about our fate. And it's not just that he was providing information. He was, um, he was a very friendly presence on the screen, friendly in a fireside chat sort of way. And that set a standard, I think, for how anyone should communicate science who even dared step where he stepped. Think about how many science documentaries there are. In fact, the very word documentary juxtaposed with the word science just feels heavy, right? Here's a science documentary and you have to plan for it and sit down and get ready and put on your thinking cap. And even though technically Cosmos is a documentary, at no time do you feel the weight of that. And so I saw my task as, as continuing this highly um, uh, potent means by which you take information and have your audience become comfortable with it. And first, you, you, have, to, you have to be sitting down with them. You can't, you can't be here with, and there over there. Then you're like professor at the front of the room and they have to listen. But if you're gonna be a communicator, it means understanding what moves them. And it means delivering, that's the writing part of it. And then I've gotta, I've, I've gotta 
convince them that I care that they care. I, I, there's got to be a warmth there. And I didn't have to practice that in any other kind of sense because I, I feel that I, I, I'm that anyway. But to do that in a scripted way where you got to hit certain lines and certain words because there's a visual coming with it, that's the craft coming together that, that I needed to sort of uh, not only familiarize myself with it, with, but um, uh, absorb it so that I can, uh, it becomes part of me as I deliver the content. And I'd like to think I've succeeded, but that's not for me to judge. Hey, let, let me say that, Neil, you owned it. And, you know, it's not for no reason that you were the only person who I could visualize, uh, even before season two, being that, 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 that beacon that, you know, not only totally knowing the science before, you know, the script was even written, but also really having that generosity of spirit of wanting to share that with the world. That's what Carl had also, was that sense of when you're in love, you want to tell the world. And science has such a great story to tell. I know of no greater story personally. And Neil, Neil just knocked it out of the park. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, and it was, by the way, there was, uh, Cosmos is now in three seasons, if you count them all, 1980, 2014, 2020. Um, and I was privileged to uh, host the, the second and third. But I can tell you that between the second and third, uh, I think I, I, I felt the, the, the setup better. Okay, I, I'm in a, in a weird spaceship awesome spaceship, but kind of weird, right? And there's green screen all around. And so in the 2014 version of this, to me, it was kind of all novel. And I wasn't thinking so much about how I'm communicating as much as, well, this is just kind of fun. <laughs> but come the third season, I, I, I felt I was in, you know, in the zone, the cosmic yeah. zone. And so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, and that's absolutely how it comes across in watching it. You mm -hmm. feel the passion radiating through the screen. And, and in terms of the way that you're presenting information for both of you, I was interested in that because, you know, you've talked very openly about how you really want this to be a show that people can sit down and watch with their families. You know, adults can watch it, kids can watch it, people that love science and work in that world, but also people who, you know, maybe didn't have that passion at school and you're kind of rediscovering it for the first time. So you're hitting so many different types of audience with it, which is really incredible. And, and I was curious about the way that you think about that when you're putting together these episodes, particularly in the way that you want to present the information and, and deliver it to us. Well, you know, from the very beginning, the people whom Carl and I were most interested in were those people who, who felt that science was too formidable, too intimidating, and didn't know they had any prior interest. And I mean, that was the joy of it, was because I was one of those people. And my identification with anyone who feels that way, alienated from science or, you know, just not into it, that, that's me. That's who I was when I set out on this. And so I, you know, the one, we talked about the criteria for how stories make it into the show. Well, most of all was uh, from the very beginning was if I didn't completely understand it as a result of what I was writing. And if, if I didn't, if it didn't move me, then it wasn't worthy of cosmos because we live in a culture where science and high technology are completely fundamental to our existence. And yet, so few of us understand anything about either of them. And to me, that's such a danger. And so, you know, here we are in this coronavirus nightmare, and the world is looking to the scientists to lead us out of it. And it's just my hope that what will naturally evolve from this catastrophe is a, a habit of mind on the part of every one of us to say, okay, you know, we dodged that bullet, but a much bigger bullet is coming with climate change. And now 
after 70 years of their warnings, we're going to finally pay attention to what the scientists are, are telling us and act accordingly. And Neil, one of the episodes that I wanted to talk to you about specifically was the one with the World's Fair, because, you know, you have such a passion for that. And I love the way that it tied in Carl's discovery and love of science and also yours. And, and you have that literal family connection with the Tyson Comet that was part of the World's <laughs> Fair, which is amazing. And, and so I was just interested in, in the way that that episode was meaningful to you in, in a different way and perhaps was a much more personal episode for you to make. Yeah, well, first of all, Anne made that connection. I mean, it's just two very simple, isolated facts. Carl went to the 1939 World's Fair at age six or five. I went to the 1964 World's Fair at approximately the same age. And Anne said, we can make hay out of that, <laughs> so, <laughs> or more than hay. So out came this, this beautiful juxtaposition of, of, of periods in our time where uh, periods in our culture where looking forward and knowing while you're looking forward that science and technology is foundational to what the future is that you're imagining uh, that's a very important connection to make separated by those many years and then leapfrogging into the future to 2039 the interesting thing about imagining a World's Fair in 2039 is first you have to imagine the world in 2039. Then you have to imagine the future that they're imagining in 2039, right? So it's a double future um, exercise. And as Anne began this, this um, uh, uh, podcast saying, we don't want to be the ones saying, you're all going to die, you're all going to die. We want to be the ones saying, we're all going to live. We're all going to thrive. And here's, a pathway, it wouldn't have to be the pathway, but you need these hopeful threads through from the present into the future and the world's fairs as they were conceived in those two incarnations were, I think there was nothing like it. And yes, my, I was a kid, my whole family um, uh, cared about uh, these cultural offerings of the city. We went to museums, we went to the parks, we went to the zoo, the aquarium, and World's Fair came through, we were there. And so, yeah, I, I was never the same after that. And as, as I understand, was the case with Carl. And then it was also for me, because I grew up in Queens, <laughs> so, and my brother had a summer job at the fair. So I was there sometimes four or five times a week for that dose of that great drug of hope. You know, this was during, the worst days of the Cold War, the nuclear arms race. Uh, you know, I was a duck and cover public school kid who had experienced, you know, this constant terror of impending doom. And yet I would go to the World's Fair for that hit of hope about what we, we could really do if uh, we could avoid uh, our own destruction. And so that is in, that's inspired me my whole life. And when I first understood that uh, Neil also had a completely uh, natural relationship with that same time and place. I was ecstatic because now we could really, as Neil just said, we could now we could show a future which had that same kind of hopefulness. Um, and so it was, uh, it, it just, I, it exceeded my dreams. Also, because we were so lucky to be working with Jeff Oaken, our VFX supervisor, and Carl uh, Walter uh, Lindenlaub, and uh, so many tremendous talents who were attracted to work on Cosmos, not because of the hefty fees, because we couldn't do that, but because it's, it means something. It has some significance. So, yeah, that was thrilling. And just to add um, to that list, also, um, all of these people, the, the, the sort of top, you know, top shelf people, uh, they, 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 they made very big names for themselves in very high budget cinema, right? Uh, and so to, we can say to ourselves, should this level of talent only be applied to superheroes or to um, love stories or, or whatever else 
is what we're, we are fed by the entertainment universe, um, should, should that talent only be reserved for that kind of storytelling? And I think the answer is no, it should not. It should also be, um, it should be shared. <laughs> and this is exactly what they did. And um, plus the, the, the music, the, the, the soundtrack. Oh, Alan Silvestri's music. Uh, yeah, Alan Silvestri. These are, these are, you know, name brand people who all came to, 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 to offer their expertise, basically to- Don't to forget the, Ruth Carter. Oh yeah, it's Ruth Carter. She, Ruth Carter. Okay, Ruth Carter. You know, I, I know we were like a small potatoes given the stuff she's done, but nonetheless, you know, they didn't have to come to Cosmos. All right, but there's my outfit and that of the the, the background actors is conceived by Ruth Carter. And what else? She gets the Academy Award for costume design for Black Panther. Right, so. Uh, that told me, I'm sure it told Anne, but we haven't explicitly talked about this. It told me that there really is a level of caring in the arts, in this community of talented people, where they know that the future of science literacy is going to make the difference between uh, 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 driving off a cliff, off the waterfall, and creating a world we can all be proud of, or that our descendants can be proud that we initiated possibly even beginning with Cosmos itself. <laughs> I'd just love to add to what you said so beautifully, Neil. And that is, you know, we're talking to SAG, uh, an organization, a union that I have tremendous respect for. And I'd like to say something about the other voices in Cosmos. You know, there's a story in this season of a botanist named Bob Love, And he's a man who I've been kind of in love with for more than 20 years, wanted to tell his story for more than 20 years, his heroism, his fearlessness in the face of brutality and cruelty. And um, we were lucky enough because of our fellow executive producer, Jack Jason Clark, to enlist Viggo Mortensen to be the voice of Bobby Love. And I, I think I learned as a director in that experience, because after all, the, um, the visualization of Favi Love was stop action motion, you know, so some, something we never used before. So it was just Vigo's voice. And Vigo maybe had eight lines, but somehow he managed to capture in a way that makes me choke up every time I hear it, the, the wounded idealism of a man who is in conflict with what he loves most, and you know, the disappointment of realizing that the, that the institution, the state that you have worked so hard to help found uh, with such high hopes has now been corrupted into, into something murderous and brutal. And Vigo, in those few words, captured it in such a way that it gave me um, an even greater sense of respect for this great art form. That's really wonderful to hear, because even, even watching it, I think the voiceover work that you have, the reenactments, it's all so brilliantly, brilliantly done, and you've hired such great performers. And, and it takes such a huge team to pull this show off as well. I was reading, I think it's, is it 987 crew members it takes to... On the button. Nine, <laughs> 987 of us. But I was just curious about, even just from the, the logistical standpoint, um, you know, particularly for you, and how you said about managing a crew of that you know, of that size, particularly in making sure that everyone has the information that they need, that they have, you know, the creativity to do what they need to do best, that the information is flowing, and that also everyone walks into an environment where they feel the passion of, of what the two of you are trying to convey. That was, you know, this was, uh, I can't tell you, I don't want to sound like some gushy idiot, but I have to say that it was years of unalloyed joy every single day, running, getting up in the morning, bounding over to work, you know, and I can't wait 
because of Brandon Braga, because of Jason Clark, because of Sam Sagan, who is a relative, but still, because of Andre Bormanis, because of Joe Magucci, who produced the show. Every one of those people was working tirelessly to uplift everyone else. And it was a perfect kind of experience. Um, the camaraderie, the sense of a common purpose. You know, that's in this period of quarantine, that's, that's what I miss so deeply, was that sense of interacting with a thousand other people, all of whom were giving it everything they had. And by the way, it wasn't just the next gig for them you felt that there was an extra investment of energy and emotion and intent uh, in everybody who participated. And that's the, you can see it and you can feel it every day. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, Neil kind of, and touched on this a, a little bit earlier and mentioning, you know, right now there's this massive divide between, between science and politics. And I was curious for you with your work on this show, how you really hope that your role and your work with Cosmos can help to be a voice in, in opening up that communication and hopefully starting to break down some of these roadblocks that scientists are facing because the ideas are always there, but it's the means to actually investigate and, and do these things. Yeah. So Cosmos, remains a potent force in this effort, but because we live in a time when there are so many platforms, so many media platforms, you don't get the guaranteed focus that, for example, Cosmos 1980 got. Cosmos 1980, there were how many TV stations were there? You know, six, 10 at most. And um, you'd be home at night, The I don't know, even know if the concept of event television even existed yet, because all television was event television. So, yeah. so we, um, so you have Cosmos, I think, sort of owning its its place. But there's so many other ways people receive information through social media, through their friends, through through web pages, and so so I I, I worry going forward that people have stovepiped their access to enlightenment or information or what is objectively true. And it's, it's a, it'll be a big task getting people to communally, um, to communally be touched by Cosmos. And in the rest of my life, I'm in these other activities, I, you know, podcast and books and, and Anne, oh yeah, so Anne, Anne has the, the, the companion book there are people who are readers and not watchers, right? So, so that this is the two pr two pronged attack there. Forgive the military term attack, but that's that's what it feels like. It's two ways you can have access into it, and there are more ways that I'm engaged in. And we do the best we can. I, I don't know what else to say. And we're, we're well. I'm really excited to say that Cosmos is going to be on Fox in the very near future. An announcement will be made, and it's right now in more than 170 countries around the world. So what I love about that is that even though everything Neil just said is true, there is a kind of siloing of information. The fact is, is that you cannot cast a bigger net than 170, more than 170 countries. And you know, I still get emails texts from people who became scientists because of the first cosmos or became science teachers very important or researchers technicians engineers mathematicians and so you know for me you always have to deal with with the with the forum that you are dealt and with the uh, and i think this is actually the best of them all because we, we are in the process of becoming a single intercommunicating organism. And we're very lucky that that's true. And I just, you know, I just uh, hope for the best and, uh, and just want to keep on doing this as long as I can. It's because we're in a race between uh, our wisdom 
our cleverness, our goodness, our humanity, and other forces that are real. They're not supernatural, they're real. And so, you know, we just have to, all of us have to try everywhere we know how. Yeah. One of the things that I love in watching the show is that as well as telling us stories of, of things that have, have passed in science, that it's also full of ideas and, and possibilities. And that's such an important theme throughout every single episode, the ideas of what could be. And there was something that kind of struck me that you said recently, Anne, where you said that that was always important to Carl, but that he was kind of harangued for including the, ide the ideas that hadn't been proven yet in science when making the original cosmos. And, and so for both of you, I was interested in just the reason why it is so important to not just talk about scientific facts that have been proven, but to really talk about the possibilities that we can still investigate, that we can still reach to and still aspire to. Uh, I, I would say one of the things Anne succeeded in doing is making sure in the script that you knew when we transitioned from established science to to more speculative science. That's, that's, you owe that to the viewer. And that's not always done, by the way, where that yes. is blurred out there. <clears throat> so I think um, Anne captured that correctly, accurately, and sensibly in every time we went to a place that was the artist version of what the science could be, rather than the visual effects of what the science is. And, and, and just to add to that, you know, in the first cosmos, uh, I remember because, uh, you know, with some tinge of bitterness, but because I loved him so much and I still do, that Carl was, you know, roundly criticized for engaging in speculation, being so highly speculative. And yet I, I invite everyone to go back and look at the first cosmos, a personal voyage, and to hear those speculations and to tally the number of them, the percentage of them, that turned out to be right on. And that's a tribute to both Carl and Steve Soder, our collaborator, and to their scientific imagination and acumen. As we said in that first cosmos, without imagination, we go nowhere. And so you, I think it's, it's you know, I love science fiction because it's, it's imagination that's fueled in, to some degree, varying degrees, some less than others, <laughs> by, by the little bit of knowledge of nature that we've been able to glean through our science. So I am, you know, I'm very proud of the, of the leaps that we took in the first one and, uh, and hopeful about the ones we took this season. Yeah, well, I think it will be really fascinating to, to be watching this current season, you know, 20 years from now, 40 years from now, and, and seeing all the amazing ideas that the two of you had within it that have come to actuality. And thank you so much for taking time to talk to us about the show. This has been such a genuinely enjoyable experience, and, and I hope that everybody watching, if they haven't already been diving into Cosmos Possible Worlds, will check it out on Nat Geo and, and on Fox soon as well. well thank you, Mara. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Great to see you, Neil. Yeah.